Welcome to another episode of The Bretty Bank Show, where it is all about connecting creatives, artists, musicians and their stories. Hey guys, this is Brett Yang and today our guest is Nicholas McCarthy. He is a one-handed pianist who studied at the Royal College of Music in London. He only started learning the piano at the age of 14 and right now he is 27. His career has already expanded to concert playing, solo playing, doing TED Talks, uh, playing at the 2012 Summer Paralympics in London, appearing on BBC Radio, and so much more. I think he had a lot of interesting things to share, and so without further ado, I hope you enjoy this episode. Oh, by the way, for some reason I have lost the introduction of our conversation. I don't know what happened, technology just didn't work this time. But that's okay, we still have the most important part, so I'm just going to cut you guys in abruptly into the conversation. And a chill out weekend, that's what I'm oh. having having today. <laughs> we all need that, don't we? <laughs> that's nice. We do, absolutely, absolutely. Oh. Well, thanks so much for asking me to, to be on your podcast, I really appreciate it. No, it's my pleasure. I found out about you about 12 months ago. Uh, yeah. And then I also, then, then surprisingly, I heard you on um, Tim Ferriss' podcast. Yes. And I yeah. thought, whoa, <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, you know, when I, I mean, I'd never heard of Tim Ferriss, to be honest. Um, and then uh, it was it was my manager said, oh, you've been asked to do this podcast. And I'd, I'd been asked to do loads and loads of them, like all at the same time. Yeah. Um, so I was like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. You know, you know what it's like, kind of you, yeah. it's building a name for yourself. You just kind of do everything, yeah. stuff like that. Don't you? <laughs> and uh, I think <laughs> no, any publicity is good. So um, did the podcast. And then then he started like Simon, my manager, started sending me stuff like, you know, this disclaimer form that I had to sign and all this stuff, which kind of was quite unusual yep. for a podcast. <laughs> and then I started to think, oh, OK, I should really Google this guy. <laughs> <laughs> so I Googled him and then realised it was, the, you know, the Tim Ferriss. Um, but, you know, it was a really such a nice guy. Um, and it was so great to be on his show. And the reach that that show has, obviously, we know he is Tim Ferriss, so he's got a large reach. But I was just so surprised that how much you know how, how many people know me now through that that one podcast is quite phenomenal i was just um, going to ask you um yeah so like yeah and like on twitter and like the dialogue from fans on twitter and things like that and you know my album in the states went back up into the charts and you know things like that wow. simply for the fact that i'd been on his podcast so yeah it was um he, he's a really nice guy and i'm yeah very thankful to him because he has definitely got my name you know to, to a wider audience who wouldn't necessarily know who i was before so um yeah thanks tim ferris <laughs> congratulations like uh, yeah, and there. thanks for having me on as well because i'm you know i'm a big fan fan of yours and what you do with with two sets so yeah it's uh, it was great to see to see when you uh, when you messaged me oh thank you <laughs> Um, okay, this, okay. I wonder if we just start now. I mean, there's so many Yeah, things. let's go for it. Um, okay. Let me, let's see. And just so I know, after we finish, we'll go on to your podcast as well. Yeah, yeah. So again, mine's just, it'll be half hour. It'll probably be very similar to be honest, just chatting. And I just want to be asking you about kind of social media strategies or, you know, how you develop two set and stuff like that. So okay. yeah, we'll come cool, to cool. that later. Awesome. Um, okay, let me just see if everything's running. The internet connection in Australia is not the best. Um, oh, is it not? Because well, <laughs> it's so fast, isn't it? Probably. Oh, uh, it's and you know, it's surprising we did invent Wi-Fi here. Um, <laughs> that's still the worst. <laughs> by accident, if you didn't know that, we invented it by accident. I didn't know that. Um, and somehow the rest of the world made it better, refined it, and Australia is still kind of on, <laughs> <laughs> on the very first prototype. Um, so what I did then was I just tried to switch to my 4G on my phone because I had problems with Wi-Fi in the past. Oh, uh, okay. Mm, there you go. So big phone bills for you then. Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> Actually, that's another <laughs> thing. They don't have unlimited um, 3G here. Um, don't they mobile data in australia i think the rest of the world is already on top of that yeah we have kind of unlimited yeah they're still milking us by the gigabyte yeah whatever 
Um, okay, before we start, is there anything that you don't want to talk about or? No, no, open book. Awesome. Beautiful. And let's see, we're all good to go. Hey guys, this is Brett, and today we have Nick Nicholas on the podcast. Um, I have been a big fan of his playing for the last 12 months, and he is, if you don't know him, he is probably most known for his virtuosic piano playing, but also his techniques with just the left hand. Um, Nicholas, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me on. Uh, okay, I just want to dive into the questions as fast as we can. Um, but can we first, could you please explain to everyone who you are, what you do, and where you now? Of course. So um, I am a concert pianist. I was born without my right hand. So it's not really the first choice of career mm -hmm. that a one-handed person would choose. Mm -hmm. um, but I decided that's what I wanted to do. I loved music. I loved piano, especially. And then I found out this, you know, great repertoire of left hand alone music. And I thought, well, you know, I've got a left hand. Why not give it a try? So I started off and uh, and then very quickly, you know, went to the Royal College of Music and then graduated. And my career was kind of, you know, already in full swing. So, yeah, that's that's what I do now. <laughs> um, do you have actually, do you have a practice routine? Um, no, I wish I had. I really, really wish. Practice for me mm -hmm. has always been really difficult because I started at the age of 14 so really late so I had a completely normal childhood with no musical constraints no discipline really in that sense in you know a musical sense so when I started at 14 I absolutely loved the piano so it was almost like my my addiction really and so I was always at the piano but I wasn't working then you know I was playing for pleasure I was playing for joy and I was enjoying the learning aspect of it Whereas that I found when I started, you know, it became my job to play the piano as much as I love my job still. And I love the piano and love the music that I I play um, when I, it had to be more structured. You know what it's like when you get booked to play a concerto or something. You have to quite structure it mm -hmm. to think, right, I need to be learning that alongside refining this because I've got that coming up next season. And, you know, you've got to think about a bit ahead. And so uh, practice schedule. I'd love to be one of these people who, you know, every morning I do two hours and then in the afternoon I do four hours. I'm just not that person, unfortunately. And I do think it stems from the fact that I'd never, it, as a child, I'd never had it. So so I've had to kind of learn on the job, really. Um, so, yes, I kind of try and steal moments where I can. Luckily for me as a left-hand pianist, I only really put the demands on myself to do about three hours because right. I can't really do more. You know, it's not, if I was a two-handed pianist, I'd be, you know, wanting to do six to eight hours. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, as a left hand, I, I used to try when I was at the Royal College, I used to always compare myself to my, my you know, pianist contemporaries and think, uh, oh, why, you know, they're doing 10 hours practice a day or they're doing eight hours practice. Why can't, I don't think I've ever managed to do eight hours practice in a day. And then I realised, I was like, well, I'm not them. I've got one arm and I'm playing completely different repertoire to them. Um, and I've got to be really careful. You know, I really have to be careful when I'm playing, you know, Chopin Godofsky or I'm playing something really, really tricky. Um, I, I do have to be careful because, you know, if anything goes wrong for me, then I really am out of action for, for a long time, if not permanently. So, um, yes, I, I, when I'm, I always try and do my three hours, but it's not always possible even then. <laughs> well, I'm so glad that you said you don't have a routine, um, because I feel quite the same, uh, when I was in my teenage years, even now, really, I think everyone talks about scales, um, studies and, there's a bit of a confession. I've only actually ever played three violin studies in my life. Um, and I've kind of, I guess it's the same as you, you learned it while you, you learned your techniques while you learned the piece. Yeah, of course. And of course. I think, you know, there's so many, you can almost make exercises out of difficult passages of music. You know, that's what I do all the time. I remember people always say I'm very good at, at uh, you know fast octaves it's one of my thing which I, I find quite easy but the reason is is because I was in when I was um like 17 I was studying as a junior mm -hmm. 
all of my contemporaries were playing all the big romantic concertos like Rachmaninoff and Tchaikovsky's first and things like that. And I was so jealous because I couldn't play those, of course. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, looking at Ravel and Benjamin Britten and they're not as lush as those big Tchaikovsky Rachmaninoff concertos. So I was very jealous. So to get over that, what I did was I used to just learn. So I learned the Tchaikovsky octaves, the famous Tchaikovsky octaves. Mm -hmm. Um, just in obviously in my left hand and just to fulfill a little bit of uh, a need I think from my point but in fact that absolutely made me good at octaves and um, I so now I you know when I used to teach I always used to say to my students then you know look for passages of music which you're impressed by or you're inspired by and see if you can create a, a little study out of them like the Tchaikovsky octaves or a big fast passage of double thirds or something like that um, and, and learn them just on their own, you know, as a, as a standalone. And, and that in itself is more enjoyable for one because it's musical and, you know, it's not just endless scales. And two, you get a bit more satisfaction out of it. I don't know about you, but I kind of always found, found it quite satisfying to do that. Uh, I'm exactly the same. Uh, there's this, you know, there's this technique in string playing, especially violin playing. Uh, it's called up bow staccato, and it's yeah. quite. It's a technique you have to kind of figure out for yourself. Um, and so there was a piece with Wynowski Polonaise, I believe, it's number two, and there were mm. all these up bow staccatos. And my teacher just gave me the piece and said, "Here, you're going to play this at this Stedford in a few months. Um, just go for it." It's like you said, it's like I developed this obsession and need and just this pure joy of just learning the upper staccato within the piece. Um, and that way I learned upper staccato, um, likewise with your octaves and the techniques. I guess the question following that would be, do you ever think, or was there a stage when you practice the piece so much that it becomes more of a study, like a routine? Yeah, I mean, I've definitely over practiced in my time when I was certainly when I was at the Royal College when, you know, the technical exams were coming up and things like that. Um, and then I find, you know, that over drilling of something, mm -hmm. it it just I, I just found that, you know, that monotony set in and, you know, I wasn't probably playing the, my best, whereas in fact, it, all I needed to do was actually stop practicing and go and go out for a dinner with my friends or something, you know, go and do something else. And then, you know, just, just to relax a little bit, because I, I, I was so hell bent on, on kind of, you know, proving my worth because having one hand and going through the lights of the Royal College and the Junior Guildhall and stuff, mm -hmm. as I was the only one and the only one they'd ever had, you know, the only one handed pianist they'd ever had, I always felt that I kind of had to prove myself a little bit more than if I was just, a, you know, the standard two handed pianist. So I think that's why maybe I, you know, when I was doing the Chopin Godofsky studies for my, t my second year technical exam, mm -hmm. um, I think that dr that over drilling of things, it was probably quite detrimental. And that was the closest time actually I ever had to tendonitis. Oh, wow. um, so that taught me a good lesson actually. Um, so yeah. Okay. And okay. There's a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> so where do we start now? So many questions. When you were studying at Royal College, uh, being a one left, uh, left hand, one left hand, left handed pianist, um, were there, I guess the first thing I would think of is we unsure of a career, um, given the history of, you know, everyone has, everyone plays the piano with two hands or well, most, most pianists did. Um, where did you, if you aren't sure, where did you find inspiration and drive to keep going? Um, I think for me, you, you know, I, I found out, I found so much repertoire, you know, there's, there's around 28 concertos for left hand. There's 3000 solo works for left hand alone. So there really is a huge lifetime's worth of repertoire, whereas a lot of people think it's really small. Um, and it, yes, it's small in comparison to the huge two handed piano repertoire, but it's certainly not a small repertoire. Um, it certainly is enough to have a career, you know, a lifelong career with the problem is with that is I think through history, left hand repertoire has become somewhat forgotten or somewhat, you know, people only are blindsided by Ravel left hand concerto yeah. and, 
you know, Prokofiev's Fourth Concerto and Britain's Diversions. They and people a lot, even classical music buffs, they kind of only they kind of stop at those three concertos yeah. really. And I'm thinking, but what about the other twenty odd concertos that are, that are there? <laughs> so for me, it, I kind of took it upon myself to to try and change people's mindsets and try and almost educate in a in a little way because I found it so fascinating educating myself on the repertoire yeah. and finding out what was available and finding out why that was written and finding out all these interesting fascinating stories as to why these pieces came about and so then it was like, almost like I was on a crusade then to to go out and and show not just the classical music world but the general public you know not just classical music fans I wanted general normal people like my mum and dad are completely non-music people they're just normal hard-working people non-music background not a musical bone in their body and I always said if I can impress them and make them sit up and listen to this piece of music then I'm doing something right because they actually don't have an interest in classical music so I kind of almost got a bit of a I don't know a need to have a wide audience outside of the classical music world. Mm-hmm. So I started doing, you know, talk shows and things here in the UK, some popular like morning talk shows and things. Wow. But I was playing Scriabin, Nocturne on on there. Well, I don't think they've ever had <laughs> a classical piece on there, let alone Scriabin's Left Hand Nocturne. And all of a sudden I got all these people who were coming to my concert saying, oh, we didn't know you could have a piano recital, like just a piano on its own. You know, people who really didn't know about classical music and about recital, about anything. And they said, so we saw you on telly and we've, you know, we've come and bought tickets. And oh, my God, it was absolutely amazing. And I see those people every year, year in, year out from that moment. And so that that makes me so happy because not only and I say to them a lot, I said, not only have you discovered classical music now and you can now go and, you know, explore all the wealth that's there. But you've actually started on the most niche point of this small, you know, unknown or semi-unknown repertoire. And when people come to my concerts, because I talk all the way throughout my concerts, um, they kind of leave feeling quite educated and and informed in a, in a nice contextual way. I always give the funny anecdotes to my pieces. You know, there's always a funny reason as to why this piece was written, or there's always a tragic reason or an interesting reason. And, and I think, I just like to put the pieces of music in context for people because then they know what they're listening to. The amount of people who, and if you think most people in the world don't know about classical music, they don't know, they're not knowledgeable about classical music. But I always say to them when they say that, you know, they find out I'm a pianist or something, so I don't know anything about classical music. I say, but you don't need to know anything about it. Do you know anything about jazz music? Do you know anything about pop music? No, but you listen to it and you enjoy it. You do you know anything about Adele's, you know, Skyfall and how that was created? No, but you listened to it and you bought the album, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's all these things, whereas I think people in the mainstream world, they kind of feel they have to have a degree to enjoy classical music. And that's yeah. always what I've kind of fought against. Mm-hmm. Did that answer your question? Sorry, I do like to talk, as you can probably tell. Yes. And I've just been <laughs> rambling on. As, as you're talking, <laughs> I have so many questions. And then you come up with not, all these other points. And I thought, wow, there's more better questions I want to ask. I have um, a bit of a chat about. Okay, uh, I love the way when you when you say you explain and talk to the audience, and um, how we don't really, I guess, there's this culture behind classical music, uh, how we need education, we need to have some sort of knowledge to be able to enjoy it, um, <clears throat> and. I would love to ask you, how were you always uh, quite a confident person in talking? Um, did you develop a skill on the side, and how did the two come together within the concert? So I was always a good communicator. Mm-hmm. Um, I was always very confident as a child. I always quite liked the limelight. You know, if I was at a family party, I'd be the little kid telling jokes to the adults because I just like making people laugh and things. Um, so I was always had that kind of quite brash confidence. Yeah. Um, but then I started to, when I, well, a bit further on when I kind of, my career had launched, if you like, I started ask, get, getting asked to, to do 
you know motivational speaking and after dinner speeches and things for businesses and and then TED Talk approached me to do their largest TED Talk at the Royal Albert Hall in London and so I I, I wow. started to kind of being very confident and talking very happy talking in front of a big room of people to then having to hone my craft because I was being paid to by businesses to mm-hmm. to get certain points across and to motivate their employees so with that when when it turns into again when it turns into a job you think about things differently you know I think more strategically I think right what is this business asking me to do how am I and my story which is completely unrelated to what this business is doing but how am I going to relate that to them and how am I going to might use my story to inspire them and to motivate them to reach their targets or to reach their sales pitches or whatever they need to be doing and so I started to think about it more strategically and and you know I, again it's all about learning on the job I think that's the best thing so yes I think confidence was always there but I honed it throughout my my years so as you're doing this have you um have ever considered um I guess self-branding uh, because as you know as a musician we for me anyway I was always in the practice room practicing and it never really occurred to me that in this day and age branding self-branding was a thing um, something that an artist could explore so I wonder if I'm sure there are artists out there curious about how to promote themselves um, what would your advice be yeah I mean the thing is for me when I was you know on on tv when i first started out um my thought was it's pointless being on television unless you've got a product to sell <laughs> and that sounds very mercenary but you know when you're in front of six million people on a morning tv show and you haven't got a live show to sell tickets at and you haven't got an album available i think it's actually a bit of a waste yeah because yes it gets your name out there but actually there's a lot of people who want to buy an album or who, or who then want to come and see you live and i learned that mistake very early on because i you know was very pleased to go and play live on and have a you know 15 minute chat on the red sofa on itv's this morning yeah. but it was probably too early because it's one of the it is the biggest talk show here in the UK mm-hmm. and I, I had a really really big slot on it but actually I didn't have anything to sell <laughs> so I very very quickly um found on Twitter and things you know I had a very small Twitter Twitter following then um you know people were saying oh we'd love to have bought your album but we can't find it xyz <laughs> so then I saw a demand there so I self I quickly self-produced very crudely I think it probably cost me about 250 pounds um in total <laughs> to produce an album which I then set up my website I then sold it through my website and that album did really really well um so I was you know I saw then that how to leverage things and how I could you know I could I could sell sell things and and then I started getting fans then because once someone's bought your album Mm -hmm. when they then see you're playing live the likelihood of them wanting to come and see you live is probably quite high Mm -hmm. as opposed to maybe if they haven't heard of you and they don't have your album so once I started selling the albums I then saw more fans coming to concerts and things like that um And then social media, my one regret, my one regret is not capitalizing on YouTube. I wish I, Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, I think every non-YouTuber or, you know, non kind of successful YouTuber would say the same thing, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I wish I just started kind of talking at camera and mixing it in, whereas I was so hell bent on just putting performance videos on there, not realizing that actually a lot of my fans want to, hear about me mm-hmm. and want me to be chatting as well and that's part of it what they like about me and um, so that's the, probably my biggest regret um because I do think you know even if I started doing just you know vlogging now and YouTubing now I think the, the boat has kind of nearly sailed with that yeah. um okay. so yeah that's probably my biggest regret but I, otherwise branding wise you know I, I knew that I had to have the website I knew that I had to have a social media presence um and I think again you learn on the job you know at first I was I was tweeting I was just really really I remember I had eight followers for ages like probably about nearly a year eight followers I was just tweeting out to like nobody like (laughs) one of them was my dad one of them was my nan set up a twitter account that she never looked at and um and then all of a sudden you you start this dialogue and and for me Twitter I really love and I know everyone's like oh Twitter's dying and stuff I don't believe it is I think it's almost like a focus group 
Twitter. Right. You know, I put something out in Twitter and I have a really good dialogue with, with my fans. And, um, and likewise, Facebook as well. Instagram for me, even though I know it's absolutely huge, I don't get as much from Instagram. I don't. I don't have as big a following on Instagram as, as my other accounts on social media, but I just don't get and get the dialogue. So I don't get, you know, I like that about Twitter and Facebook, that dialogue I get with my fans, whereas Instagram, I'm a bit like, yes, it's nice to get, you know, 300 likes on a photo of my, my dinner. But <laughs> actually, you know, is this really, you know, is this really helping my brand? Probably not. Probably not. So I don't know. It's interesting. I mean, you, you're you're far more advanced, you know, social media than I am. So what would you be your take on that? What, like with Instagram, for instance. Um, I haven't looked at your Instagram, so I don't know what I could say for you. But it's, from it's my experience boring. is, um, Instagram is definitely on its way to its peak and reaching a peak. So. Yeah, it's very very uh, popular right now. Um, yeah, but I think with social media, from what I've observed, is that it's always changing every day. And yeah, there's always something else. There's always something, um, and it's hard. I mean, to... it's like you know, I'm on, I'm on Snapchat, and I quite like Snapchat. And oh, I, I like love just, Snapchat. You know, adding adding my stories and things. But now, obviously, Instagram stories are out. So then you're having to save your Snapchat story to add it to your Instagram story. And I think, God, when is it going to stop? Are Twitter going to do video stories now that we have to then do it on all, each platform? Yeah. And I just think then it starts then getting less enjoyable yeah. when you have to, you know, because all these platforms are competing, which I get, you yeah. know, that's fine. But it's, I'm, it's getting a bit laborious with the whole... It's like a chore, isn't it? It is really, and, and it's less organic. That's why I think I just like... Twitter still it's kind of plain and simple and mm -hmm. you have to think about your words more you know I, I like that I have to mm -hmm. think about what I say to my fans and it's I, I quite like that so yeah Twitter's definitely my favorite then Facebook then Snapchat then Instagram <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah we actually just started looking into Twitter we kind of ignored it for a while um, and I must admit I do enjoy it I feel like I've missed it a lot in the last few years uh, just the fun cheeky comment or status out there and the, the people starts retweeting you sharing it we start having a conversation which is really nice um like you said it's more direct than instagram or facebook um but i don't know for instagram honestly there was a period even now there's a period where organic reach was really high mm. um i do think instagram is they're, it's owned by Facebook, so they're eventually placing the same module on Instagram. Um, mm. I also think, I don't know if I'm correct, but the reason why they also um, had high organic reach was to take customers from Snapchat. <laughs> right, okay. Uh, maybe. This is just a theory. I yeah, surmising, yeah. Um, because that period when they launched the live videos, you know, the 24 hours uh, stories, the organic reach was huge. It was incredible. Um, and I noticed a lot of artists took advantage of that posting, you know, the 10, 60 minute skits, not 60 minutes, 60 seconds um, playing and stuff. But, you know, yeah. I mean, I guess just do what platform is best for you and what you enjoy. And there's no point in yeah. Instagram if you don't like it. And that's the thing, I think, for, that's what I would say to any other artist. You know, you do have to have a presence on, on social media now. And um, some of them can take them to the level that you've taken it to, which is, it's hugely impressive and fantastic. Some of them Thank can you. take it to the kind of mid level, like myself, and some people can have just a small, you know, for small but select group of following. I think either or, or is fine. Mm -hmm. um, I just think it, it does have to be. But so many artists just haven't got a clue. They really don't. They had, considering they're in our era, you know, they're in yeah. our decade of the social yeah. media, internet driven <laughs> everything. They still don't don't know. They still and and I think part of it is. I don't know about you, where you, because where did you study? I studied in Brisbane at the Queensland Conservatorium. So you, yeah, so I'm not sure what it was like at the Queensland Conservatory, but at the Royal College, yep. they didn't teach you anything about self-promotion, oh, websites. I think yeah. I was the only person in my, my year who had who had a website with a shop on it, you know. Wow. <laughs> so I think, I think sometimes our industry <laughs> is, I think, the only industry that is very ashamed to be commercial. Yeah, 
Um, and I think that's such a shame because it's not about the money because we, I think if we all wanted, you know, lots and lots of money, we wouldn't go into playing the piano and the violin. Yeah. You know, we would be going and being a banker or something. Um, there's a lot easier ways to earn money. Hmm. But at the same time, there's nothing wrong with being commercial. There's nothing wrong with having products to sell. There's nothing wrong with, with, with the commerciality that, that, it's now starting to change in our industry, but it's lagging behind everyone else, I think. I'm very glad you said that um, because, uh, I, th I mean, now everyone's moving towards us slowly. We're kind of steering this ship around. But even just, say, a year ago, two years ago, like you said, we're so behind. And I think a lot of people, it seemed like social media cheapened classical music yeah. in the eyes of many. Um, I, and also, especially with Eddie and I being in classical music, as you can imagine, it was very hard to unplug ourselves out of there yeah. and kind of see what social media is actually worth, uh, what it can do for you as an artist. Um, so that, um, unwiring took years of coming in and out. Uh, I guess my question to you would be, how do you balance, playing at such a high level at a concert level and spending time on social media <laughs> well i don't because i'm not as good as it as, as, as the likes of you and, and other artists um i i would love to be like for instance yesterday i was filming a, a celebrity quiz show mm -hmm. that's quite popular here in the uk and i was on the panel what's and the show called it's called celebrity eggheads so it's a quiz show so uh, there's five uh, five celebrities going up a team of professional quizzes mm -hmm. um so i was on on this panel with some you know some real celebrities <laughs> yeah, nice. and uh and i i saw a lot of them they were you know they were snapchatting the whole thing you know on their story they were think they were literally all the time taking a video log if you like of this for their various platforms yeah. and one of them had a manager who was kind of doing it for them um and I, I am just not that person. Part of me, one, I like to enjoy the moment. And I am a big person where I just think, no, sorry, I just want to live in the moment. And I do that. And I, I don't want to live through the phone screen. Mm -hmm. But and then other times I get like an addiction to it. And I'm like Snapchatting everything. And I'm, you know, so I go, I go to opposite end of the spectrum. So I think that's why I've been very mid-range on my social media success you know I've got a nice following and I've got but it's not a huge following like yourself um I think because part of me I, I I'm a bit lazy with it sometimes and yeah. you know what it's like you've got to be quite relentless with it really haven't you oh yeah um <laughs> sometimes and I'm just a bit lazy <laughs> yeah I, I like you see you dive in a deep end you get addicted and then you jump out of it I sometimes just indulge in both sides I kind of go, oh, I'm addicted. Oh, well, let's just go all out. Or when I'm out of it, I'm like I'm probably practicing. When I'm really just really want to practice, I just say, okay, well, social media is just not on my mind and I'll be practicing for the next concert or something, doing the necessary stuff, you know. Um, yeah. Can we, let's go back to while you're studying at Royal College. Um, yes. I, what was it like studying there? I mean, it's from Australia. We all talk about studying overseas, um, and it was to when I was studying at the conservatory at Royal College, Royal Academy, you know, Juilliard, Curtis, these places in the states and the UK were the places to go to. Uh, mm. What was your experience like there? Was it the hype? that I don't know what the hype was for you, but was it the hype that you expected um, and the pros and cons, basically? So I'll tell you about how it came around first because mm -hmm. that's quite important to sure. then answering your question. So I went to Junior Guildhall first and I went there from the age of 17 to 19 because I took a gap year. So I went from 17 to 19. Um, and because, bearing in mind, I'd only started at 14, you know, it was it was very short time um and guildhall junior guildhall was really difficult for me because i had a very good teacher but i think the general consensus was throughout the whole 
of Junior Girls Hall, bar one teacher, um, my duet teacher at the time, who's lovely and she's a friend of mine. Um, I think the general consensus was that I was giving a, given a place at the Junior Guild Hall to tick a box because they didn't have a disabled person there. Right. So, and I, my, I now know for a fact, in, in fact, that my friend who was a duet teacher at, at the Junior Guild Hall when I was there, she had certain members of staff coming to her saying, so, so why is this, this guy even here? You know, what does, what does he want to do? You know, they had no belief in me whatsoever. Okay. And so when I then come out with the fact that I wanted to go to the Royal College of Music, well, it was like I'd said I wanted to fly to the moon. <laughs> I mean, it was completely, you know. So two weeks before I was due to audition, I auditioned for every conservatoire in the UK because I didn't know as, as I was the only one, whether they'd all open arms, invite me in and welcome me with, you know, a big party or if they would just shut the door in my face. Mm-hmm. So I, even though I always wanted to go to the Royal College, I auditioned for everywhere. Mm-hmm. And, um, and two weeks before I, I decided to, you know, well, two weeks before my auditions were to, to begin, um, my then teacher and the head, the head of, of the Junior Guildhall called me and my parents into a meeting literally to tell me that they felt that I wasn't going to be accepted anywhere oh, um, into any of the conservatoires. And they strongly suggested that I withdrew my applications and went and studied at a place called Coventry College. Now, okay. in the UK, I don't think even anyone has heard of Coventry College and it isn't a music play. I think it's just a, it's, you know, it's somewhere where I'm sure it's a fantastic institution. Don't get me wrong, yeah. but it isn't, in you know, where I wanted to... in comparison. Yeah. yeah. And they're, they're not specialist in music. They're like the Royal College or the Royal Academy or, yeah. you know, so I went away from that feeling hugely deflated. Can you imagine two weeks before? All That's, the auditions are yeah. starting, and and that is what my 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 teacher and the head have told me to do. So I promptly ignored them, and went and did Good my choice. auditions anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and then my first audition, because then all of a sudden I'm filled with self doubt. I'm thinking, well, they must be right. They're professionals in the industry. They they know, you know. Uh, I went and auditioned for the Royal Northern College of Music first, mm-hmm. um, and I was really nervous because I think you know your first audition and you know. Anyway, they offered me a, a scholarship on the spot. On so the I was spot. like, oh! I was like, yes, straight away. At least I could, I've got one place to go. Yeah. As if I, as, all I was so worried about, I didn't want to go to Coventry College. And uh, so I was so thankful. Anyway, I went to the second one, Birmingham Conservatoire, offered another scholarship. Um, then I had, I went to Royal Welsh College of Music, offered a place there. Trinity offered a scholarship. So I was offered all these places. And then the London auditions came. And as you know, the London, the big three, you know, Royal Academy, Royal College and Guildhall. Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't get offered a place at Guildhall and that didn't surprise me at all. I didn't get offered a place at the Royal Academy because I think the fact that I was half an hour late for my audition because I went to the wrong, <laughs> the, the wrong, the wrong train station. Um, and then the Royal College I went to, I auditioned and I was offered a place, but not a scholarship. Mm-hmm. And I then took that, that place and, um, because I, I, that was always where I wanted to go. That was where I dreamed of going. And yes, I know financially it would have been more savvy for me to go elsewhere. Yeah. Actually, I think the benefit for me being having one hand and having to probably double prove myself a lot of the time to the industry, yeah. studying at somewhere like the Royal College gave me more credibility, I think. Mm-hmm. So I was happy to pay that price. So when I arrived at the Royal College, I was it was ecstatic, you know, walking down from the Royal Albert Hall. St- have you been? Have you been to the to the Royal College and or the Royal Albert Hall? No, I've only ever, I've been to London once, and I don't quite remember okay. where it was. So the Royal Albert Hall is obviously beautiful, beautiful venue, and you know, I, the most iconic venue. Um, and it is literally built right opposite in a beautiful. It's purposely built to be in complete opposite and symmetrical to the Royal College. So the Royal College piano teaching rooms yeah. have a completely uninterrupted view of the Royal Albert Hall. Oh, that explains so it's, why. I, it's I have just friends, so inspiring. I have friends posting photos of their practice rooms and there's the Royal Albert yeah. Hall. 
Uh-huh. Exactly. That's that's why. So when you're walking down the steps towards the Royal College from the Royal Albert Hall, mm-hmm. you know, the Royal Albert Hall's behind you, the Royal College in front of you. And it's just such an impressive building. And it is one of those moments where you think, wow, I'm I am a student at the Royal College of Music. And, and, it, and that didn't wear off. I must admit that for the whole four years that I was there, that pride remained. Mm-hmm. It definitely did. To answer your question now about, you know, what's the hype, I would say that I don't feel that it needed to be a four year course for one. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel that the first, you know, I think that you could definitely do it in three. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think that would be my, my one, my one little complaint Two, I don't think, I don't think the, with me, they were very good because they, they just allowed me to provide the repertoire because they didn't know the repertoire like I did, of course. So they just allowed me to provide the repertoire as I felt fit. So it, say I needed to play, you know, a large scale romantic sonata. Yes. Most people would be picking the Chopin sonatas or even the Liszt sonata or something or Schumann sonata. I don't have them available to me, as you know. So I would provide something similar in length, similar in style you know, just to try and almost substitute for them. Right. And they were quite happy with that. Mm-hmm. So in that sense, they were really, really great. In other senses, I felt it was slightly unfair in, say, for instance, the technical exams. Yeah. So in your first year, second year, third year, and fourth year, it's probably the same with, with when you were studying. Yeah. You have to do your repertoire exam and your technical exam. Yeah. And for the technical exam, you have to play two contrasting studies. Mm-hmm. So most people in their second year are playing maybe some of the Mendelssohn studies or, you know, they're not really playing the big list studies yet or the big Chopin etudes and things. They, they, they save them for third and fourth year. For me, because, you know, I, I didn't have a great deal of, of studies available to me. I don't have books upon books upon books of, of etudes. I was playing in my second year, the Chopin Godofsky studies, which are, you know, Mark andre Hamelin and people, you know, even say they're the hardest pieces in the whole repertoire. <laughs> So they were way, way too difficult for me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was found that I was having to play them. Yeah, I was being assessed exactly the same criteria as someone who is playing oh. something of a, a Mendelssohn study, oh. which is far, 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 far easier. Yeah. So I think that was the only thing where I think they could have changed it slightly. I liked being judged the same way. I did like that. But yeah. at the same time, I felt because of my repertoire constraints, yeah. And the difficulty level was so much higher. I felt they could have given a leeway or, or could have given a, a 10% extra because or I don't know, however they wanted to do it, but they didn't. So I never did particularly well on my technical exams, even though I would say I'm quite a technically proficient pianist, um, which I always felt it was slightly a, a bit of a shame because I felt it actually wasn't my fault <laughs> because I would never have ordinarily you know, if I had two hands, I would never have picked in my second year a list or Chopin etude to play. Yeah, I would have saved that for third or fourth. But I was kind of had I had to I was forced to do that. So that would be the only thing I would say. But I had four happy years there. And um, they've been they've been very supportive. And, you know, I, I'm I'm still very proud to, to say that I studied there. Yeah. And also possibly the fact that you got to play those hard pieces got you where you are now. Um. <sighs> Few more questions, just to respect your time. Uh, so, with being, being a concert pianist, I'm curious because we're we're planning a world tour with two set uh, this year. Um, are there the variances in the audience, and if so, do you change the way you talk and you play for them, and how do you deal yes. with abnormal? So- I find the older I'm getting, I'm 20, I'm 27 now, mm-hmm. nearly 28. I'm finding I'm becoming a lot more free mm-hmm. and a lot more happy to do what I want. Right. Whereas years back, I used to feel I had to conform to this c- classical conforming, you know, path. And actually, I just, I'm not that person for obvious reasons. You know, everything about me, I'm the opposite of what, you know, most people start at the age of three. I started at 14. Most pianists have two hands. I've got one hand. You know, everything about me is kind of the wrong way round regarding how you should do things. Yeah. Um. So, and likewise, career-wise, you know, most people get their, their success from, you know, winning a competition and then, yeah. then they sign their album deal and stuff like that. I've never played a competition in my life. So... Yeah. I've I've always done things kind of my own way 
and it, I would only say it's the, probably the last two, two, three years that I've really taken that on. So, for instance, I kind of do the pop model of the album and tour. So yeah. I will release my album and then I'll do a, uh, I'll do an album tour of it. Okay. Whereas that's quite rare in classical, really, unless yeah. you're in crossover. Um, and of course, throughout that, I have then my my standalone, maybe a couple of big concerts throughout the year. And then I'm off on tour in, in other countries. So that's how I kind of work, really. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas that, you know, that is not really done. So I think I'm I'm quite unique in that sense um about just my how I like to roll how I like to do things and likewise with my tour I like to be quite controlling over my tour I like to make sure that you know my merchandise is all you know approved and and I'm quite I I almost I suppose it's it's kind of like a pop model obviously on a far far smaller scale Mm -hmm. it's not like arena um but it's almost like that pop model of of touring but but on on a classical scale on a small small scale for me um so yes yeah, so in that i then feel they're my own shows which they are so i'm completely myself on stage my fans know me they know my humor they know that i chat and i make jokes and i make them laugh and um, they know I've got a little Pomeranian binny who I sometimes bring on stage as an encore and they know that my partner's my manager and they love him as well. And, you know, so I've kind of got a really lovely fan base and they're kind of like a family. And, you know, so I feel so comfortable on stage. And then other times I get booked to maybe play in a festival when maybe they're not my my core fan base. Yeah. But at the same time, in the last three years, I would say I'm acting exactly the same on stage in those venues you know in a festival or something where where they're not my they're not my audience necessarily um I'm actually in exactly the same way and I found that be that stood me in such good stead just to be myself and I think it's literally literally taken me all these years to uh, until like three years ago to actually just be myself throughout the whole of what I do whereas beforehand I would chop and change you know, sometimes I would be, you know, very, very staid. And if I'm at a very classical thing, I'd be very staid and, uh, you know, very proper. And and now I'm just not, you know, I'm I'm just I'm just me. And I, I do. I still crack jokes on stage and I still make people laugh. And and it just makes me feel better. It makes me play better because I'm more relaxed. So, yeah, I just I, I definitely just do my own thing, which which is very freeing. I love it, really. Did you remember the point or there was a point where you felt free on stage? Um, was a few, uh, yes, was many times. I mean, yeah. my, my last my last album tour, which I was, was in October, November. Um, yeah, that was that was I mean, every 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 day it, it was just like playing to my friends. You know, it was lovely. Um and I'm on tour again this autumn with my with my second album. So, again, I look forward to, to that. And, and they're growing each year as well, which is nice. You know, it's quite nice to see. I like I like things growing organically, yeah. you know. <laughs> um, I like that. And I've been offered many, many times to do the likes of Britain's Got Talent and things. And, you know, yes, I know I'd have a far bigger fan base than I have. I know that. But at the same time, it's not organic. And I like an organic growth because I think organic growth lasts a lot longer than if I was overnight famous because I was on a TV show. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I, it, it does. It's a different fame and it's a different fan base and things. So, yeah. So so what I'm, I'm very happy with what I'm doing. I'm very happy that everything's growing as well. Well, wow. OK. Um, thank you so much, Nicholas. Is where can people find you before we finish? Where can they look you up? So you can go on my website, nicholasmccarthy.co.uk, or on YouTube, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and McCarthy Piano. Um, yeah, I'd love to chat to some of your fans and and uh, and love to meet them virtually. <laughs> awesome. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks, Brett. Hey guys, this is Brett again. I hope you have enjoyed this episode. If you want to hear more of these talks. Subscribe and leave a comment. Also, don't forget to find the show notes at breddybang.com. Once again, thank you so much for listening.